good afternoon all so i can see that we've had some attrition we've lost some people but very good uh, congratulations and thanks to the people who managed to stay on for the third lecture so uh, let's left uh, let's start from where we left off last day so our main focus now is we were trying to define what a bose einstein condensate is in a much more general manner we learned about bose einstein condensates for ideal non interacting systems but we wanted to define it in a very different manner um, basically by using the property of a single particle uh, density matrix and now uh, we started with like two particles and then we quickly realized that it becomes harder and harder uh, to do it with this uh, uh with, with this wave wave function symmetrizing uh and so we wanted to uh when in 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 order to describe a system with very large number n of particles we said we have to have a slightly different way of thinking of the system and that's why we introduced uh, this many body operators and so basically we went into this fox space where we describe our states by the occupation number of different single particle states and we in, ensure that we uh, introduce to make this convenient we introduce these very nice operators called the annihilation and creation operators which have this commutator relation which naturally take care of the fact that these states that we produce by populating these single particle states are already well symmetrized and they have the bosonic property uh, that the wave function is symmetric under exchange of particles remember that that when we looked at the two particle case that was the very important thing that gave a larger off diagonal uh, di uh, off diagonal uh, density matrix element and our aim is to look at this off diagonal density matrix for a large n system for any arbitrary n system and that is why we were introducing this process of uh, we were introducing this process of uh, uh, you know that's why we are introducing this process of uh, uh many body operators okay and and fox space okay so now with that uh, let's let's continue so we uh, apart from these uh, operators which create or annihilate particles in in particular single particle states we also have uh, newer operators that we defined which are somewhat more generic than this which are called field operators which uh create or annihilate a particle at a particular position r these are particularly interesting operators because these have some relation to the concept of our wave function which we expressed of a general wave function in some single particle state which we expressed in this manner right so now uh the last thing we did was apart from uh we wanted to uh, complete this idea of uh, taking everything written in terms of this first quantized picture where we write the hamiltonian of an n particle system or operators of n particle systems by summing over uh, each particle's hamiltonian and we are going to translate these kind of operators into this language with these fox space creation and annihilation operators that's what was the last thing we did um of course uh, this topic in itself uh rigorously showing how to convert this single particle operator and write them in terms of creation annihilation operator it's somewhat more detailed and i can't go into all the details of this some more detail is in my notes but for now what we showed yesterday is if i have a single particle operator single particle operator means it is sum of operators for each particle and it operates on one particle at a time if i take such an operator examples of such operators kinetic energy total kinetic energy potential energy of n particles all of these are such operators now i can write such operators in the language of these creation annihilation operators i was showing yesterday in an arbitrary single particle basis given by lambda i in such an arbitrary basis i can write this in this manner a dagger alpha k sorry a dagger lambda k a lambda j and the usual quantum inner product of lambda k whatever this small operator is alpha j sorry lambda j right so 
uh, if this is O is P squared by 2M, then you will substitute P squared by 2M here. If it is a potential energy, you will substitute V of R here. And with that, you can basically get this. Okay, and a particular important, uh, particularly important representation is if the single particle basis is, for example, the position basis, in which case these A's, as we just talked about, talked about are given by these field operators. And one can essentially write, uh, let's, let's write some important operators like the kinetic and potential energy in terms of these field operators. The idea is to follow the same thing here. For example, let's take the potential energy. So I will have a D3R1, D3R2, right? And then I have V of R, and I will have basically two states, R1, R2, right? And then I'll have a psi dagger of R1 and a psi of R2. Now, this potential operator, this is diagonal in the position basis. Therefore, V of R, R2 will give me V of R2, delta of R1 minus R2. As soon as I do that, I can immediately see that my potential energy in this field operator language will be given by V of R, psi dagger, integral of V of R, psi dagger of R, psi of R. Okay, so it becomes diagonal. Similarly, my this is my kinetic energy, sorry, this is my potential energy operator, and my kinetic energy operator in the same way is just going to be given by psi dagger of R minus h bar squared by 2m grad squared psi of R, because the potential energy operator is represented by this uh, differential, right? Diagrad square P squared by 2M is represented by this operator in position space, okay? So this is how you represent single particle operators. Of course, remember that, as I said, uh, though we've so far considered Bose-Einstein condensates with no interactions, our aim with this whole formalism now we are introducing to define BCs is to actually be able to also consider interacting systems. So it would be very nice to also get what is the uh, representation of uh, an interaction uh, in this second quantized language. So in the first quantized language, how do interactions look? They basically look like this. For example, if there are two particles and they have some interaction potential between them, it is always going to be of some form like this, right? The position dependence and there is some interaction, two part, sum of two particle interactions is going to be like this. Of course, this, if you want to count each pair only once, you have to sum over i less than j, or you can sum over arbitrary i, i not equal to j and basically divide by half because one, two, one, two, one will be counted. So now, how does one represent such a first quantized operator in terms of second quantized? Now let's just do it with the field operators because that's the only thing we'll be interested in. So let me call this just to be different. Let's me call this U of RIRJ to distinguish it from single particle potential. In this case, the interaction energy operator will be represented. Now you will need four field operators. Actually, it is going to be represented by half D3R1, D3R2. You evaluate this interaction energy and then you have psi dagger of r1 psi dagger of r2 psi of r1 psi of r2 okay so this will be the final form of interaction potential so with this three things figured out we are now able to actually write down though we don't need that to discuss the density matrix business this will be very useful for later my, for an arbitrary bosonic uh, n-particle quantum system in some given external potential, uh, my total Hamiltonian written, written in this second quantized form, when I have only pairwise interactions, it is basically exactly the sum of all these terms. So I have basically this integral D3R psi dagger of r minus h bar squared by 2m grad, grad squared plus some v external of r psi of r plus this interaction okay 
So this now allows me to actually treat an interacting bosonic gas with many, many atoms using this Hamiltonian. Okay. And we will use this Hamiltonian very soon. But before that, the whole point of introducing these field operators and the second quantized language is to be able to generalize this density matrix we introduced last day for two particles, right? So this density matrix, which is an effective density matrix for a single particle in a system containing n particles, this density matrix is called the one body density matrix. And now with the field operators introduced, I can actually define this. So this one body density matrix, instead of rho to denote the density matrix, I'm now going to use N because this N is more suitable for density. So uh, anyway, it's the same thing as we did last time with two particles. So this density matrix, one body density matrix is defined as the average of psi dagger of R, psi of R dash. This average is taken with respect to the quantum state of a many body system. So this one body density matrix is a property of the quantum state of our system. And if my system is represented by some density matrix rho, this effective one body density matrix, so which I'm going to repeatedly refer to, which is called OBTM, this object is you're taking an average of this field operator with respect to the state of my system rho. So this is basically trace of psi dagger of R, psi of R dash rho, all right? So now uh, let us understand a little bit before we actually uh, connect what property of this uh, N1 of R, R dash signifies that we have a Bose-Einstein condensate and hence use that to define Bose-Einstein condensation. Let us actually look a little bit at what sort of quantity this is. So this has a lot of information regarding the system, this quantity. So let's un un unpack one, one, uh, one by one all the properties of this. For example, if I take R equal to R dash here, what happens? This is nothing. If you remember, we introduced this psi dagger of R psi of R. This is nothing but the average of the local density, or this is basically the average local density. So if I take the integral of this object, this is going to give me the total number of particles I have. So I'm interested in fixed particle systems now, right? Of course, the formalism allows us to define fixed and multiple particles, but right now I'm interested only always in fixed number of particles, okay? So really this, if I took, if I look at all the diagonal elements of this density matrix, uh, I'm calling this a density matrix, but uh, it is essentially a function of two variables. Note that this R and R dash are not the same. So this is the representation of a density matrix in position space. So I will refer to it as a density matrix, okay? So the matrix elements are with respect to two R and R dash, you are like your indices, but R and R dash are continuous variables here, right? So that is the first property of this one body density matrix. So now let us look at other properties. Now what I can do is I can, instead of looking at the field operator in position space, I can look at the Fourier transform of this object, which is the field operator in momentum space, which is very simply written as the integral d3 r e to the i p dot r over h bar psi of r. Now this is very interesting. And from this, if you substitute it uh, psi of r in terms of psi of p, uh, one can actually, uh, or psi of p in terms of psi of r, we can actually calculate the density, local density in momentum space, n of p, that is basically psi dagger of p, psi of p, right? Just like we did here, but now in momentum space. Then if you plug in basically this expansion for psi of p, one can really immediately show very nicely that this is simply given by P3R, P3S, and one of R plus S by two, R minus S by two, e to the I P dot S over H bar. And which tells you something very neat 
it tells us that the momentum distribution so if i ask how many particles are in my uh, system of n particles how many particles have momentum p that is really given by this fourier transform of this one body density matrix again it has very interesting information about the momentum distribution of my system okay so now we want to see that this object n1 of r r dash this density matrix is precisely the generalization of the density matrix we introduced yesterday for two particles let me just remind you for a moment what was that density matrix so we had two particles and we introduced this object right so we had an effective density matrix uh, which is this right so we want to show basically that our n1 of r r dash is same as this rho t of x y or r r dash but this was written for two particles and what we have is basically something uh, sorry uh, that that this rho t1 of xy where we integrate this two particle density matrix integrate one of the particles coordinates is precisely same as n1 of r r dash that is what we are going to see the n1 of r r dash is a generalization for the, for an n particle system okay so with that in mind we can just first write down what is this n1 of r r dash for a particular uh, many particle system let's now instead of taking a general density matrix let's first consider that the system is in some uh, pure state alpha okay so your many body system many particle system has is in this pure state alpha which has the following wave function symmetrized wave function right now if you write down what is n1 of alpha r r dash that is alpha as we wrote down it is the average of psi dagger of r psi of r dash alpha right so now we want to write this in terms of this many body wave function in order to do that what we can do is we can introduce an completion of identity in written in terms of these r1 r2 rn operators so there is an completion of identity which is written like this d3r r1 r2 rn r1 r2 rn which i can introduce basically at this point right if i wanted to do that i have to be aware of something else recall that this alpha is an n particle state and now i have psi dagger of r and then i am going to introduce a state with n particles here okay if i did this this is naturally going to give me a zero is this clear why because if i add one particle to this system of n this state with n particles this will become a state with n plus 1 particles whose overlap with a state with n particles is always zero okay as a result what i should do is i should actually use the completion of identity with n minus 1 particles if i did that this is what i am going to do so r2 up to rn this is identity and now let me plug that in here so then i can write my one body density matrix for a pure state basically as integral d3r2 up to d3rn alpha psi dagger of r r2 up to rn r2 up to rn psi of r dash alpha okay so now i have to work out what psi dagger r2 up to rn is now note that this r2 up to rn is not a simple direct product of uh, individual position space vectors but it's actually a symmetrized product with 1 minus 1 over n minus factorial p and sum over all possible permutations 
of the direct product state. So this is also a symmetrized position vector of n minus one particles. Okay. So now if I actually, or I can even write it in field language as essentially psi dagger of R2, psi dagger of R3 up to psi dagger of Rn acting on zero divided by square root of n minus one factorial. Okay. So this is the definition of my position space operation. Now, if I operate on this with a psi dagger of R, like I want to do here, right? What happens? I can do that. That's not a problem. I can do that by first pulling out a square root n and dividing by square root n. This will give me psi dagger of r, psi dagger of r2 up to psi dagger of rn, zero square root n factorial. And this is precisely nothing but this position state, right? So with that, and this object is just the complex conjugate of this, but with r dash, okay? So now this allows me to write n alpha one of r, r dash. And once I do that, this is just r one, sorry, this is just r, r two up to r n. And this is going to be uh, r dash r two up to r n and in a product with alpha, which is just the many body wave function of n particles that I started with, right? This is the state of my system, okay? So from this, I can very nicely write my single body density matrix. The square root n pulls out an n, square root n, and there is a square root n from here. So I have n times D3R2 up to D3RN, psi alpha star R, R2, Rn, psi alpha R dash, R2 up to Rn, which is exactly what we did when we did the two particle case, right? So we just took the two wave functions and integrated out all variables except two, right? So that is exactly what we were doing here. So we integrate out all variables except two X and Y, okay? That is exactly what happens here with this single particle density matrix and now I can basically extend this to a system that is in some thermal state e to the minus b eta alpha by z alpha alpha, right? Once I do that, my n1 of r r dash is simply one over z sum over alpha e to the minus beta e alpha n alpha one r r dash. Okay, so now this really is the exact equivalent of this rho t1 of x, y. And now, just as having this symmetrization led to larger and larger off diagonal elements, or basically rho t1 of x, y uh, does not fall to zero as quickly as rho t of x, y, basically the extension of these correlations due to the fact that you have symmetrization the same thing will apply here. And what does that mean? Here, in fact, it is many, many more, uh, it is mediated by n particles. And the whole idea is that due to the, um, due to the fact that we have an Bose-Einstein, when we actually define this Bose-Einstein condensate, we will see that uh, the character of having a Bose-Einstein condensate is precisely the fact that n1 of r r dash is non-zero even when absolute value of r, r dash is very large. So if you think of this, this is like the off diagonal element of this density matrix and this off diagonal elements uh, basically are very large once you have uh, a Bose-Einstein condensate. That's going to be the definition of a Bose-Einstein condensate and that, that phenomenon is what's called as off diagonal long range order, okay? And this happens as temperature becomes very small. Okay, so uh, 
let's now actually look at how this looks uh, when you have uh, the simplest case of a non-interacting uniform system that undergoes Bose-Einstein condensation. Okay, so if you have a non-interacting uniform system, of course, what happens is first of all, it's uniform. So N1 of R, R dash cannot be functions of R and R dash, but it can only be function of difference between R and R dash because there is basically translational uh, symmetry. So let's call this R minus R dash some vector S. Then we can write our density distribution, which we wrote down here, right? Which is N of P written as Fourier transform of our uh, one body density matrix, we can write N of P precisely in terms of uh, just this S. It is basically D3 R, D3 S, N1 of S e to the I P dot S over H bar. After some simplification, this D3 R integral just picks out a volume factor. One can immediately see that this is nothing but V over two pi H bar cube. So let me just take this out. So this is just V over two pi H bar cube and one of S, which means I can write my one body density matrix and one of S as one over V integral D three P N of P e to the minus I P dot S over H bar. So the one body density matrix is simply the inverse Fourier transform of my momentum space density distribution for such an uniform system, right? So now let me look at how this one body density matrix looks for different kinds of states. Now, if I have a normal uh, thermal kind of system with a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, so if I have a Maxwell-Boltzmann type gas, of course, my N of P as you know, and we have discussed before, it's going to be of this form, right? It is going to be some minus P squared by two M KBT, okay? So now if I plug that in, so recall that when you're talking about off diagonal elements, it means S should be non-zero. So S equal to zero is the diagonal element and clearly that will just give us the density, right? So if I make S equal to zero, I get integral D3 P N of P, that will be capital N and this is just N over V, the density, okay? It's a uniform system, so it has a constant density. All the diagonal elements are just the density. But now we are interested in the off diagonal elements. So let's look at off diagonal elements for a thermal gas. So there is no BEC here. So in this case, what happens? If I just plug this in here, this is just, if I plug this object here, this is just the Fourier transform of a Gaussian e to the minus P squared by two MKBT. And this very simply, will go as some e to the minus s squared by lambda t squared, in fact. And what this tells us is that for large s, so once I make s tends to infinity, this n1 of s will go to zero, okay? So for the thermal component of your BEC, or in general, if you just have before the Bose-Einstein condensation transition, just a purely thermal distribution of your particles in your uniform system, the off diagonal uh, density matrix, this off diagonal one body density matrix is zero, okay? For sufficiently large systems. But the interesting thing is we said when we have a Bose-Einstein condensate, a fraction of my particles ends up occupying the zero momentum state, which is what I'm representing as some N zero with delta of P, which means they are all occupying the P equal to zero state plus some fraction that is more like this Maxwell distribution gas with some higher momentum. Now, if you plug in this object, something very nice happens, which is N1 of S in the limit S goes to infinity becomes constant and it is equal to the density or the which it equals the fraction uh, of particles in, or it equals the number of particles sorry, it equals the density of particles in the Bose-Einstein condensate. This is N0 by V, right? So this is of diagonal long range order. So one can actually see that 
this uniform system has a bose einstein condensate purely by looking at the one body density matrix right i can look at okay this is stupid ah yeah so what happens basically is that what we have just shown is that when our system uniform system is about tc as a function of s my n1 of s dies down as a gaussian right so that is what we showed whereas once i am below this transition tc having a p equal to 0 a macroscopic fraction occupying my zero momentum state really shows up as this off diagonal element being non zero at very large s as well okay so this is basically the uh, one to one correspondence between bose einstein condensation and what is called as this off diagonal long range order okay so we have just shown this for a non interacting and uniform system now i'm going to extend this as definition right now uh, to basically a non for for basically a non uniform and possibly interacting system before i do that i want to take some questions if there are any okay you can unmute yourself and ask questions if you have uh hello sir ha huh? yeah yeah so basically the off diagonal elements of the density matrix they are a signature of uh, the presence of some zero modes in the system right uh, it's a press it's a signature of a macroscopic occupation of a zero momentum state in the uniform system now i will define it in a slightly different way for a non uniform interacting system in that case all that i need is the diag in the eigen there there should be one eigen state of my density matrix that is mac, that is occupied macroscopically but for a for a uniform system you're right p equal to 0 there is some population not a zero mode but there is actually occupation of the momentum mode with zero uh, momentum yeah yeah i mean i was just curious if uh, like if you are to extend this kind of formalism to uh, study for example some topological states where we also have a uh, zero momentum state being occupied will we see some similar signature in the density matrix so this this idea of this off diagonal long range order that i'm talking about can be extended to essentially arbitrary many body system but with this topological systems this zero modes i do not sure what exactly one means by the zero mode there it is basically a dissipation less mode at the edge of the system or so um so if a macroscopic number of electrons let's say in your topological system occupy such an edge mode below some transition temperature or as you tune some parameter of your system yes you can still use this off diagonal long range order as an estimate of that that is what i can say okay sir okay that is the idea okay so then uh, there is again a question in the chat is r to rn symmetrized because we are working with bosons here absolutely that is why we symmetrize them uh there is another question which is it's not clear why is this second quantization called second quantization it will become clear in a moment one way when we introduce the gross pitovsky equation it will be clear one way to see that is if you remember i wrote down my hamiltonian as basically in this manner so now my field operators are operators here right so i can always write an heisenberg equation for my field operators so for the non interacting part let's put interaction to zero for a moment this will exactly look like i h bar psi dot is h times psi but now psi's are actually operators so the reason why this thing is called second quantization is because here this appears as though you have because this is the schrodinger equation but the schrodinger equation is satisfied by the field operators as well so what you have done in some very hand wavy way is you have quantized the wave function itself the wave function is no longer some complex function but it is actually an operator that is why it is called second quantization if you want i hope that cleared up a little bit of this question uh if 
are there any other questions hello uh, yes yes yeah uh, so can you comment on this uh, like uh, how this uh, of uh, of uh, diagonal long this order is connected with the uh, uncondensation in in both sides like and so how is it connected with what uncondensation like uncondensed particle because we use one part one or what is density matrix to calculate those things also. correct correct so what what where are the not condensed particles okay so 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 the point is that the not condensed particles in this case for example are precisely going to still have a gaussian kind of behavior so they are the part that is dying away at large distances so they if you look at your off diagonal element above some large threshold s it will still be non zero when you have a bose einstein condensate but it goes to zero if you are above the critic uh, above the uh, condensation temperature so they contribute in some sense in a transient manner the non condensed part contributes here okay but it stops contributing once you're here for very large distances the non condensed part doesn't contribute and in another way to think of it is anyway my density uh, is the density uh, of condensed particles and we know that n excited is basically n minus n0 right we wrote this down last class so n excited is n1 minus uh, t uh, over sorry the other way around it is basically n times t over tc raised to the power alpha right so once my t is less than tc my n excited goes down but it is finite it is still there i hope this at least answered or addressed what you're asking it contributes but it just dies away at very large distances so my question when it dies away like uh, when we go uh, after a certain distance then mm. that means is it means that we don't have uh, uncondensed particles no 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 we have it but the point is uh, okay think of it like this uh, basically the the ground state or the condensate uh, is like a wave so that wave has a coherence length so a wave means a repeating pattern so essentially and since this is a uniform system the wavelength is basically infinite for the ground state but the other higher uh, non condensed atoms are in waving states that have a finite wavelength so they will not contribute at these length scales that is what one is saying so basically they are of higher energy so their wavelength is smaller and so they are not contributing to the off diagonal matrix above some distance they don't set up correlations yeah it's not that they are not there they just are important to determine this part but they are not important to determine this final part once s is very large okay uh if there are no further questions let me continue sorry uh, hello yeah yeah why does it have a uh, infinite wavelength as you said ha huh. so in this case the infinite wavelength is basically because the momentum it is a zero momentum mode right so if you want h by p the de broglie wave and goes to infinity okay okay any other questions okay if not let's move on as i said i have just explained the idea of an off diagonal long range order for an uh, non interacting and uniform system but the beauty of this whole thing is that i can actually extend this to a non interacting uh, sorry to an interacting and non uniform system uh, many things will change when that happens one thing that obvious thing that will change is for example our formula that we found uh, last class where we wrote that the number of condensed fraction is n0 by n given by 1 minus t over tc to the alpha in this was for a non interacting system so my n0 basically becomes n in the zero temperature limit okay but of course when i have interactions this need not be valid okay that that's one example of what will change in an interacting system the second thing if i have an interacting and non uniform system is that yes i can still have bose einstein condensation but the state that i occupy macroscopically below the critical temperature doesn't have to be the zero momentum state because there is no reason why my uh, lowest energy state has to be uniform because i am not in a uniform system so as a result 
a more general definition of this off diagonal uh, long range order is needed and the way one does that is by taking basically for a general case we take the uh, one body density matrix and calculate its eigen values and eigen functions right so that is defined the one body density matrix is eigen values and eigen functions are defined via this equation okay so this phi i of r are the eigen functions and ni are the eigen values of the one body density matrix recall that since this is a density matrix it's a hermitian operator and it is symmetric in r and r dash and ni these eigen values are real moreover these phi i's are actually they form an orthonormal set okay so they are a they are perfect as an single particle basis so this phi i of r form a single particle basis moreover because of the normalization of the density matrix you can show that if i take the sum of all these eigen values ni this will equal n this is very similar to saying trace of rho is 1 except now this density matrix is now has a scaling factor of capital n because this is the effective density matrix of n particles so this is just the ordinary properties of density matrix written for this one body density matrix okay so we have now basically a very special set of single particle states chosen by taking the eigen values and eigen functions of the one body density matrix now the most fundamental theoretical definition of a bose einstein condensate then is a bose einstein condensate occurs if one of these eigen functions let's just call this index i equal to 0 so phi 0 of r whenever one of these modes is macroscopically occupied which means the eigen value corresponding to it n0 let's say this n0 or i can use this capital n0 for this case so let me just sorry for this bad notation this n0 whenever it becomes of the order of n so there is a macroscopic occupation of one of the eigen functions of your one body density matrix then we say that the system has a bose einstein condensate or part of our part of the system has gone into a bose einstein condensed state okay so this is the second way of defining a bose einstein condensate that i wanted to introduce and this is extremely general you can do this for any uh, many body system as long as you know how to calculate this one body density matrix calculate its eigen value and in any given state rho if you can find out if one of the eigen values is macroscopically occupied from that you can actually say if you have a bose einstein condensate or not this doesn't assume anything about interactions the external potential uniform system nothing okay so that's why this is a very generic and powerful way to define a bose einstein condensate so let's now just see if uh, this property what is the connection between this property and the off diagonal long range order because if i now uh, since i can <coughs> i now have a uh, new basis i can actually write my n1 of r r dash in terms of its eigen basis in this manner right so that is the this is just decomposing an operator in terms of its eigen values or and eigen values and eigen vectors okay so now this what is this saying this is telling me that there is a when i have a bose einstein condensate i can pick out one of these eigen states and that is macroscopically occupied and this is the excited part and now if i take the thermodynamic limit of n and v tending to infinity typically for most of these cases when i look at this sum i can convert it into integral and in most cases this part in the limit r minus r dash going to infinity this part's contribution will vanish so and all all that will be left is the contribution from 
this condensate state, the state with psi zero of R, and this contribution to the off-diagonal element in the, uh, it, it is continues to stay uh, non-zero as long as you are with, so this phi zero, this, this, this phi zero of R actually can, uh, it can be a non-uniform function. It is not an infinite wavelength object like in the uh, uniform system, but my off-diagonal uh, long-range order basically tells me that my phi zero of R, uh, as long as I have phi zero of R non-zero, if I have some wave function and I look at phi zero of R, how far it is non-zero, the extent of phi zero of R will set what is the maximum value of R minus R dash up to which N one of R R dash is non-zero. So that is the definition of of diagonal long range order in such a non-uniform system. And this obviously, once you uh, take the, uh, if you consider a uniform system, all that is happening is you are basically taking phi i of r as plane waves, okay? So once you do that, you can immediately see that you can actually derive uh, uh, basically what we made as an ansatz here. So if I take that as a uniform system, I can show that N of P is simply this, okay? If I take uniform system and plug things in here, I'll be able to show that N of P is actually uh, going to be, which is the N of P, which is the Fourier transform of this object is precisely going to take the form that I made at the ansatz I made, right? It will just be N zero delta of P plus parts that come from uh, non-zero momentum states, okay? Now, typically for uniform systems, I can really write down what my condensate wave function is like here, but in non-uniform systems uh, and strongly interacting systems, I have to really have knowledge of uh, the full system, uh, the full uh, one body density matrix to reliably determine phi zero. So the rest of this lecture and the next lecture is going to be about weakly interacting systems, in which case we can actually uh, do a little better and actually determine an equation that is followed by the condensate state phi zero of R. And that is going to be the uh, rest of this lecture and the next lecture, okay? Good. So that's the idea of octagonal long range order. So now let me actually talk about two other important implications of this the way that we uh, uh, found the, uh, or basically, we want to understand what is the implication of defining a Bose-Einstein condensate as the occupation of one of these uh, states uh, where uh, phi, phi i are defined as basically the eigenstates of the one body density matrix. Now, and our BEC is when one of them, phi zero of R, is occupied macroscopically, right? And we want to see what is the implication of this. First of all, since this phi i forms a basis for my system, I can always transform and write my field operator in this phi i basis and write it as sum over i, phi i of r, a i, okay? This is completely valid, where this a i's will follow bosonic statistics, okay? And precisely this a i dagger a i is this n i, right? So I'm just writing uh, whatever I said before uh, in terms of uh, the density matrixes, eigenvalues and eigenvectors. Uh, sorry, where is this? Uh, yeah, so whatever I said in terms of the density matrices, eigenvalues and eigenvectors, I'm just writing it in terms of operator language. So I now have a, a preferred single particle basis for my system given by the eigenstates of my one body density matrix, and I can write my field operator, expand it in this manner, okay? So now the idea is that once I have a Bose-Einstein condensate, I can actually separate out one of the eigenstates, which is the eigenstate that is maximally occupied or macroscopically occupied, 
and there is the rest of these states that are excited states which are not uh, part of the bose einstein condensation so now this phi zero of r is really the wave function that characterizes or the function that characterizes basically the condensate so the condensate's density distribution the condensate itself is going to be characterized by this single particle wave function phi zero of r okay so now one can do a very interesting approximation at this point uh, when the occupation of this condensate state a0 a0 dagger which is the condensate fraction becomes much greater than 1 so basically it is macroscopic and n0 by n is slowly tends to 1 when most of the atoms are in the condensate then we can make a further approximation here which is very interesting the approximation which is called the bogilyubov approximation corresponds to replacing these operators a0 by square root of n0 a0 and a0 dagger which are operators we are going to replace them by just number square root n0 okay so why is this allowed so the basic idea is that the operator nature of a0 a0 dagger is what gives them this commutation relation a0 a0 dagger has to be one which is the bosonic commutation relation but now if you write this commutation relation out right now in the limit that my uh, condensate occupation is very large right my a zeros here are basically if i want and magnitude or norm of these operators, these are going to be very large, right? So this is square root n0, square root n0. And this is of the order of the left-hand side is of the order of the number of particles in my condensate, which is approximately the number of particles in my system at extremely low temperatures, right? So then I can completely ignore this one here. And I can think of this as the commutator vanishing between A0 and A0 dagger vanishing. And that is equivalent to saying that my com my operators are replaced by numbers, okay? And this is called the Bogilyubov approximation. And this is basically uh, uh, something that will be very useful now when we try to actually write down and closed form equation for this uh, phi zero of R, okay? Um, so now, uh, all that we are doing in this Bogilyubov approximation is we are replacing this phi of zero a zero by some square root n zero phi zero of r. And this total object is given a name and given its own symbol, psi zero of r, or sometimes I'll call it psi of r. And this is called the condensate wave function. Okay. And it plays a very important role in the theory of Bose-Einstein condensates. And we are going to really look a lot more into this mean field, uh, into this thing. In a way, one can think of this whole Bogilyubov approximation as taking the field operator, which was written as A0 psi 0 of R plus the excited component and replacing it by a mean component psi 0 of R or a mean field plus a bunch of fluctuations delta psi and this delta psi is given in terms of the excited non-condensed part okay so the whole point of what we will do next is we are going to work in the limit of very low temperatures and fairly dilute systems where we can actually completely ignore these fluctuations and hence we can actually write down a governing equation that is an equation just for this mean field part alone that equation is going to be this gross pitovsky equation and studying that equation solutions of that equation will tell us a lot about condensates themselves. So the condensates that you make in the lab, you can describe their behavior by purely looking at the behavior of this mean field in certain limits. Okay. And that's what we are going to do next. Uh,
a couple of small remarks before we get on to this uh, gross pitevsky equation is this psi zero of r which is i called it this condensate wave function uh, really is also like an order parameter for this bose einstein condensate transition why because when t is greater than tc psi zero of r which is square root n0 times phi 0 of r. This object is 0 when t less than tc and finite, sorry, 0 when t greater than tc and is finite when t less than tc. Because n0, remember, has this behavior that we've written down multiple times, t over tc to power alpha. So n0 is finite and non-zero non only below the critical point of Bose-Einstein condensation. Hence, one can think of this psi zero of R as an order parameter for the Bose-Einstein condensate transition. Secondly, this is also a wave function. This is the wave function of the condensate. And hence, one can write it as a complex quantity with some magnitude and phase. This magnitude basically tells you the local density of this many particle system, because this is a wave function for this cloud of Bose-Einstein condensate. It's not a single particle wave function. So the magnitude of this is actually the density, the physical density of a Bose-Einstein condensate, square root of that. And this part, the face of it, it plays a very important role uh, in deciding the fact that this is like a wave. So it decides that this wave has some coherence and it also has deep connections to superfluidity and how the velocity flow of this cloud looks like. Okay, so those are the two remarks I want to make. So I'll take a break again and I'm happy to take some questions before I next introduce uh, Bose-Einstein, the, the gross pitevsky equation describing the dynamics of a Bose-Einstein condensate. Questions? Either I've been too clear or I've been completely unclear. <laughs> I do not know which one. Okay, uh, maybe questions will come later. So let me move on uh, and go to the third part of this lecture series. Uh, how do we describe the properties dynamics and equilibrium properties of a Bose-Einstein condensate. So this is the gross pitevsky approach. Okay. All right. So now we want to write down an equation that characterizes the uh, dynamics and equilibrium properties of this condensate wave function. Okay, or this order parameter. In order to do that, let us start from a slightly different point from where we were in the last part. Let's start with the full many body Hamiltonian, right? So the full many body Hamiltonian, which we wrote down for any, for, for an arbitrary uh, Bose condense, bo boson gas of bosons with n particles was this, right? So it was psi dagger of R, kinetic energy, written in the second quantized formalism. This is some applied external potential, psi of R, right? Plus interactions. Psi dagger of R2. This UR1, R2 is my interaction, psi of R1, psi of R2. Now, so far, and I want to do this for an interacting system. So I, I'm interested now in the Bo uh, Bose-Einstein condensation in a real interacting system. So I want to keep these interactions on. I'm not just interested in uniform, uh, you know, uniform or completely non-interacting systems. Okay. So now I have to really take this question of interactions head on. Okay. 
and let let us do that what is the form of this interactions in a gas of neutral atoms such as the one in which a bc was realized in 90s right so the first point regarding these interactions is that i've already assumed only binary interactions and that is justified because it's a very dilute gas so only two particle interactions are taken care of more than two particle interactions are very rare in a very dilute gas so dilute gas allows me to approximate uh, my interactions as just coming from binary collisional interactions okay now in principle if i take two neutral atoms and look at their interactions it is fairly complex so if i plot the interaction potential between two uh, sort of uh, neutral particles it is of this lenard jones type interaction where there is it falls away uh, at uh, very large distances but it has a hard core repulsion at low separations and this can be a fairly complicated potential and we are not interested in using this potential to describe this interaction actually what we are going to do is we are going to use what is called a pseudo or effective potential and this effective potential we are going to take it in the simplest form there is which is called a contact or hard core potential of this form okay where a is the s wave scattering length okay now let me very this whole idea of the interactions between the atoms of a bc this is a field in itself i not going to give you a lot of details but let me very briefly justify why am i allowed to use such a simple form for my two particle interaction in this bose einstein condensate the idea in order to understand that you have to go to the scattering theory describing two uh, neutral atoms that are interacting right so if you want for this scattering problem if you write it in the center of mass frame of these two particles scattering states are described via the schrodinger equation right and i can basically uh expand this psi of r in this angular momentum basis this is called the partial wave expansion if you have had some courses on quantum mechanics you might have seen this right now i can do this and i can now derive for such a central potential i can derive an equation for this chi right so this equation slightly more complicated that i have there is a reason why i am writing this uh this equation of r minus l into l plus 1 over h bar squared chi k m so the key reason why i wrote it down is when you look for this chi when you look at the equation of motion or the schrodinger equation for this chi you see in addition to your applied potential there is basically a centrifugal barrier right so at l there is basically your v of r plus l into l plus 1 by h bar squared r squared this so it should just be r squared this provides a barrier okay so this is called the centrifugal barrier and when l is large this centrifugal barrier is very large and as a result your total wave function you can assume that only the l equal to 0 component is important the higher l components face a lot of uh, basically they are they they require energy to be very large at very small energy my uh, my my amplitude to be in higher l states is suppressed because of the fact that the effective potential is larger due to this centrifugal barrier okay so in this limit i have to just worry about the l equal to 0 case which means in my scattering problem i do not have any angular momentum it is all just head on scattering so there is basically this is what is called s wave scattering okay so in this limit my scattering amplitude basically becomes just theta independent it doesn't depend on theta it's just head on and it is basically equal to this uh, minus a where a is the scattering length okay so as a result i can actually write at very large distances between the atoms i can write my chi k0 this wave function purely using just uh, 
1 minus r over a it purely depends just on the scattering length a okay so as long as i am focused on physics that is over length scales that is basically very large compared to the range of this interaction potential my scattering wave functions do are dependent only on the scattering length a they are completely independent of the short range part of my potential okay which means i can use any potential as long as i am interested in describing the physics at particle separations that is large so in a dilute gas i can basically choose the simplest uh, potential i want whichever is the simplest potential i can choose the simplest form of the potential as long as the scattering length is still a and this u of r this simple pseudo potential i took is precisely a potential of that form this is a good exercise in scattering theory if you are interested if you take this kind of a delta potential you can show that this chi k0 of r is still c0 1 minus r over a so that is why i am going to take such a potential and that's the only kind of interaction we will choose once you choose such an interaction your hamiltonian your many body hamiltonian becomes much simpler okay so your h let me just copy this becomes okay your h becomes this plus u0 by 2 p3r psi dagger of r squared psi of r squared okay so this is my uh, many body hamiltonian uh, describing a, a gas of n bosonic particles and this is my external potential i apply which will be a harmonic trap or i will also consider lattices in the last lecture but this is a very important uh, sort of uh, hamiltonian that describes all of cold gases and ultra cold atoms okay so this is super important so now i can do what i mentioned earlier in class from here i can write down the heisenberg equation corresponding to psi right so if i just write that down and use the fact that psi of rt psi dagger of r dash t this is delta of r minus r dash right so this is the commutator property then my equation just becomes ih bar d psi by dt of rt equals minus h bar squared that squared by 2m v external of r plus u0 psi dagger of rt psi of rt psi of rt okay so this is the equation that describes the evolution of my field operators okay now this is the equation that is generally valid at all temperatures and all uh, situations for a gas of bosons now i want to add to this equation the fact that i am interested in describing just a bose einstein condensate how do i add that information i use simply my bogi lubov ansatz right so we said that once you have a bose einstein condensate i can really write my equation as psi zero of rt plus delta psi and now i am going to completely ignore any fluctuations which means all of my atoms are in this condensed state okay i completely ignore fluctuations and so i can simply replace the operator psi in this equation by the mean field psi zero of r once i do that i get this nice simple equation so this equation with this normalization condition this 
is the equation that describes the dynamics of a Bose-Einstein condensate. The stationary solutions of this equation will describe the ground state of a Bose-Einstein condensate. And this equation is what's called the famous gross pitevsky equation. Okay. And this is central in describing uh, Bose-Einstein condensates. Okay. So now I want to just make a, uh, and here this U0, as, as I said before, is basically four pi h bar squared a over m, where a is the scattering length, okay? And the sign of a tells you whether the interaction is attractive or repulsive. I did not mention this earlier. I have actually a, a very nice knob in these ultra cold atomic systems or Bose-Einstein condensate systems, where I can actually tune the sign of this scattering wavelength, a, and I can make it from positive to negative by using the fact that this is made up of the, there is a complicated internal level structure for these atoms and I can manipulate it with magnetic fields. And I can use something called Feshbach resonance, Feshbach resonance to actually tune this A from positive, so repulsive interactions to even attractive interactions. So this is a knob that I have as well. So which is makes these systems versatile, as I mentioned, earlier in the uh, lectures, okay? So this is the gross pitevsky equation. Let me just make a few remarks based on this equation. Let us take this equation up while I make the remarks. So the first remark I want to make is, what have we done? We wrote down an equation for a quantum. We started with a quantum, uh, uh, we, we started by describing uh, the atoms using a quantum field or a quantum field operator. And now we have taken a limit where now we've written an equation for uh, a classicalized version of this quantum field or a mean field version of this quantum field, okay? There is an analog here uh, we can make with electrodynamics. So if you know, uh, basically, if, if you start with quantum electrodynamics where you describe uh, basically uh, the, the electromagnetic field in terms of photons and creation and annihilation operators for photons, and then take a classical limit, you end up with the well-known uh, ob objects like electric field, uh, vector potential, magnetic field, and so on. And these end up satisfying Maxwell equations. Whereas this is basically uh, this process that we have done is very similar, but here this uh, object, the classicalized version of the quantum field representing these bosonic atoms satisfies this gross pitevsky equation. But one very uh, nice difference is that in this gross pitevsky equation, H bar remains, whereas there is no H bar in the Maxwell equation. This is a curious thing. And the reason actually is very interesting. And the reason is very simple. Uh, the reason is, if you look at the energy uh, dispersion relation for photons, it is given by C times P. This leads to omega being C times K, right? On the other hand, for a massive particle, like what we are using to describe here, E is actually P squared by 2M, and the omega, the frequency, is given by H bar K squared by 2M. That is precisely the H bar that remains here. Okay, when you divide, uh, if you bring this H bar over to this side, basically H bar remains here precisely because of the dispersion relation for massive particles. So this is almost like uh, the Maxwell equations uh, and the relation between electromagnetic field uh, photons and Maxwell equation, but slightly different. Okay, that's one thing. The second thing from the form of this equation, it is already should be clear. If I did not have this term, this is just a Schrodinger equation for psi zero, okay? So what is this term doing? This term is making this a non-linear equation because you're actually having uh, the right-hand side depend on psi zero and in a, uh, a non-linear way, psi zero squared, okay? So this is a non-linear uh, Schrodinger equation. And this combination between having a matter wave, which is described by this BEC wave function and this nonlinearity, the, the, these two effects together make uh, give lots of interesting properties to this gross pitevsky to the solutions of this gross pitevsky equation, and as a result, it gives very interesting properties to Bose-Einstein condensates. Okay, 
Finally, I've already uh, mentioned this once. When is this valid? So the validity requires, we have to now list all the approximations we have made. First, n should be very large. That's when we can make this uh, a0 is replaced by square root n0, which is of the order of n here. So it has to be a very large n limit. The second equation is basically the diluteness uh, limit. Why is this diluteness important? The reason is we are completely ignoring any of the quantum fluctuations. And we are saying this is basically a t equal to 0 description of a Bose-Einstein condensate. And we are saying all the atoms are in the Bose condensed state. It will turn out, hopefully, if we have time, I will show that even at t equal to 0, if I include this quantum uh, fluctuations, part of my, uh, I, I actually kick out some particles from the condensate and N0 is typically less than N and this delta psi dagger delta psi, it cannot be ignored, okay? And this is basically, uh, you, you can ignore it and we are writing this GP equation here and this is basically a dilute limit, okay? So this describes a dilute Bose-Einstein condensate. Finally, one more thing is that we cannot use GPE to investigate any phenomenon that is happening at very short length scales, okay? The reason is uh, we have used this very simple S-wave uh, kind of picture and a pseudo potential. Um, that pseudo potential breaks down if you ask questions below the interparticle uh, length scales, below the scattering length and interparticle separation. So this describes the long wavelength limit in some sense of uh, the dynamics of a, con of, of a collection of atoms in a Bose condensed state, okay? So the one last thing I just want to uh, talk about today before I stop is now this is a dynamical equation just as we have a Schrod we have the uh, time evolution equation, uh, the time dependent Schrodinger equation. This is the time dependent gross pitevsky equation. I want to actually also uh, derive and also justify from here uh, the time independent version of this gross pitevsky equation. And the time independent equation solutions basically will give you the ground state of a Bose-Einstein condensate with in which has some interactions as well. All right, so in order to do that, uh, to derive this time independent GPE or the static version of this gross pitevsky equation, which I'm gonna call as GPE, uh, what we want to see, uh, the way to derive that is to first realize that this Bogilibov ansatz, as someone asked yesterday, one can also write down replacing psi of RT by psi, psi zero of RT, one can also uh, basically uh, think of this Bogilibov ansatz in terms of the many body state of the Bose-Einstein condensate. So making the Bogilibov ansatz is essentially equivalent to saying that the many body wave function psi of my system is basically proportional to this object where phi of r, I'm just writing this phi of r as just psi zero of r over square root n. So phi of r is a normalized wave function, which is normalized to one, whereas psi zero of r is normalized to n, okay? So now this Bogilibov ansatz is equivalent to making uh, the approximation that my many body state is given by this, or in other words, if I look at the wave function, many particle wave function corresponding to this, it is nothing. The normalized many body wave function corresponding to this is precisely this equation, where phi of r, again, is just one over square root n times psi zero of r, okay? This ansatz for the wave function is sometimes called the Hartree-Fock wave function. Okay, so every atom is in the same single particle state given by phi of r, okay? So now, one very simple way to derive the static version of the GPE is to consider the first quantized version of this Hamiltonian we have here, 
where I actually write my Hamiltonian as sum over I Ti squared by 2m plus V of Ri plus the interaction in terms of this delta value, delta potential. Okay. Now, to derive this uh, static GPE, all that I have to do is take this ansatz as a variational trial function for this Hamiltonian. Or in other words, I write down the energy functional corresponding to this many body state evaluated uh, with respect to this Hamiltonian, take an average of this Hamiltonian in this trial wave function, right? This is sometimes called the energy functional of my system. So if I simply plug in uh, this form of the wave function, I can actually write down the average uh, of the Hamiltonian in terms of phi of r using this. So at the end of the day, uh, if I now go back to this notation in terms of uh, basically this condensate wave function, psi zero of r, basically to remove this scaling with n, and I'm just going to also remove this sub sub uh, this sub uh, subscript psi zero the zero. So if I just plug that in, my energy functional, which is sometimes called the gross Pitevsky energy functional, is of this form. And I can take this as a variational uh, calculation where I minimize this energy, which I've calculated using this trial Hartree-Fock wave function with respect to the constraint that my total number of atoms is given by the normalization of this BC wave function. And I do a variational calculation E minus mu n should be zero, okay? This is very simple to do. You might have done this when you did like classical Lagrangian mechanics also. Once you do that, after a little bit of work, you actually end up with where we have now included this constraint using this principle of Lagrange multiplier and the Lagrange multiplier is actually nothing but the chemical potential of our system. I'll justify uh, why the chemical potential occurs here next class, but all that happens is my, the result, the wave function that extremizes this E minus mu n follows the e following equation, obeys the following equation. And this is basically the stationary version of RGP, right? I could have as well gotten this stationary equation by simply asking psi of RT should be psi of R e to the minus I mu T over H bar, okay? If I plug that in here, I would get this stationary version. And the solutions of the stationary equation will give me the ground states of my Bose-Einstein condensates. Whereas for dynamics, I can use this dynamical version of this GP. Next class, I'll begin by justifying why is it that psi of RT, the time evolution is given by e to the minus I mu T, where mu is the chemical potential and not e to the minus I E T as it would happen in a regular Schrodinger equation. Okay, so that is where I'll begin and tomorrow we'll discuss some interesting stationary uh, properties of the uh, stationary solution, a little bit of the dynamics of the GPE, 
and uh, in the last class irrespective of where i get to tomorrow i'll talk about optical lattices and uh, and and the uh, superfluid mott insulator transition which was one of the most famous experiments done with uh, bose einstein condensates and ultra cold atoms so i'll stop here if you have questions i'm happy to answer them